Hello, everybody. This is Martin Patella coming on for our Life Enthusiast Online Radio Network, reaching you and promoting, restoring vitality to you and to the planet. Today, we have with me Spencer Feldman. Spencer is a whole lot like myself, except a younger version of me. Spencer has started, indeed, with uh, a degree in engineering or technical sciences. Well, I think his degree was in math. Mine was in computer science. But the point is that he got wrecked by the mainstream medical, and then the show starts. He can't get help. He has to find help for himself. Then he becomes a researcher, and then he becomes a health nut. And here we are. Spencer Feldman, welcome to the Life Enthusiast Show. Thanks, Martin. Awesome. So, Spencer, would you be so kind, elaborate a little bit, like tell more, you know, explain the background. Why are you so passionate about the things you are so passionate about? Well, what happened to me was I was in college and uh, there was, I think, one person who had gotten uh, measles. So they vaccinated everybody in the college and I lined up to get the vaccine in my arm like everyone else. And not that long afterwards, I couldn't drink soup because my hand would shake so much that the soup would shake out of the spoon before I got it to my mouth. I said, well, this can't be right. I mean, I'm studying mathematics, but I, not medicine, but this can't be right. I don't have Parkinson's. So I went to the doctor and he said, well, here's a pill. I said, great, thank you. Why is my hand shaking? He goes, well, here's a pill. I'm like, yeah, okay. Why is my hand shaking? And what's the pill gonna do? And I guess I had exceeded my five minute allotment of time and that was that. So I never took the pill, but, um, and I didn't understand until years later, it was probably um, the thimerosal and the, that it had gotten me. So uh, a couple, I had this interest in getting myself healthy and then the internet comes along and that's a researcher's dream. So I was up till three in the morning every night going through PubMed journals and reading translations of Russian literature, uh, you know, Russian science journals. And slowly I started piecing together what was going on with people, with me. And I, I found that I had a, an ability to put, I guess pattern recognition is what you'd call it, understand why things were falling apart and how to put them back together again. Of course, that was the beginning of my career. And, you know, this is now 25, 30 years later. So uh, it's been a long and fascinating journey. And I have to say that you know, when you get a phone call from somebody, I'll tell you one story. This, is, this might be one of my favorite ones. Um, I got a phone call from, I guess, an 80-year-old woman. It was about a year and a half ago. And she called to thank me for the Glidamins product that I make, which is um, something oh, that... Yeah, it's for, uh, you know, there's the liver gallbladder flush. Well, this is a, a more gentle version where you don't drink a lot of olive oil and Epsom salts and try to earth out a bunch of big stones. It just slowly supports the body and, and dealing with the gallstones. And she calls me up and she says, I want to thank you. I'm out of pain. And I said, oh, well, that's very sweet. Uh, she goes, no, no, really, I want to thank you. I'm out of pain. My stomach has been hurting. And I said, oh, okay, well, how long was it hurting for? She said, 70 years. I mean, you know. There we go. What makes you feel better in life than, than, than that? I mean, I'm sorry she had to wait till she was 85 to be out of pain, but at least she gets a few more years where she can finally feel good in her body. Exactly. That was great. Right. So um, I definitely want to get to the details of the products with you, for sure. Sure. But, but before we do that, um, it's really interesting. I wanted to highlight the thing that you mentioned in our private conversations, which was that the stuff that happens in research mm. does not get translated into consumer accessible medication or solution, mainly because the money interests only focus on that which can take, how do I put it nicely? If they can patent it, they can make a lot of money on but because of the system they set up, they require spending $100 million or $200 million on proving something to be safe, even though stuff that we use in the natural healing doesn't require any such shenanigans. We can mm. easily administer things that we know are safe because they won't kill you or are not toxic, but we're not allowed to do that. 
and we're not allowed to say it. Mm. I'm not allowed well, to tell you that yeah. dairy juice will prevent, I don't know what, something about heart disease, or I cannot tell you that walnut husk something will mm -hmm. take out the um, parasite and so on, right? I would say that I have um, three large challenges with the way the medical establishment runs right now. The first is, as you mentioned it, the costs to bring a drug to market are so high that a drug company won't do anything that's not patented, and that means a lot of natural medicines never get pushed by the big drug companies. Uh, they need someone smaller, like me, who will be okay with a small marketplace. With that. Uh, The challenge isn't just that natural products don't make it to market. That's a huge issue. Uh, part of the issue also is the legal system that, um, what happens to doctors? So for instance, in Germany, it's not so important whether you follow the uh, standard of care. What matters is if you hurt or help someone. And if you hurt somebody, you're in trouble. If you help someone, they don't care how you did it. Or at least this was true 20 years ago. I don't know how it is in Germany now. In the United States, it's the opposite. It's fine if you kill someone, if you're using the standard of care. But if you help someone off label, you can lose your license. So that's an issue. The other thing is, um, I think modern medicine shines its greatest in the emergency room. I don't want an herbalist, if, uh, if, if you're dealing with a car crash or a gunshot wound uh, where they're bleeding out or a uh, hemorrhagic virus is raging through their body and you have to put a, a needle in to get fluids in and, and be really heroic. This is where modern medicine, it shines, it's its best. And alternative medicine, the exact opposite. It's really great with chronic diseases, with understanding what was the imbalance that allowed this particular disease process to manifest slowly over the years. And it would be just as silly to go to uh, a alternative practitioner when you need an emergency room, right. I think, is it would be silly to go to a drug model when you're looking to deal with a chronic condition. Right, but the problem is that currently, as the medicine, the pharmaceutical industry, owns the insurance companies that own the pharmaceutical model, that own the government, the lobby, the Senate, the Congress, the works. The medical school curricula, all of it, yeah. Even that, yes. So now that it's so interlocked that it... It's, it's, like, it's like cancer. It's like virus. It's just consuming the host. Well, I think it has been for a while, but the internet's making things change. Um, nowadays, you don't have to go to a doctor for the, to get an opinion. You can type something in on the internet and have a thousand opinions, some by physicians all across the planet, some by alternative practitioners. So that, that uh, monopoly of information has been broken to the internet. And I think what's going to happen is, and we're seeing it now, uh, a movement towards alternative medicine for what it's really good for. Uh, the downside is some people use alternative medicine to sell things that are inappropriate. So, you know, it's, it's caveat emptor, it's buyer beware, but at least now there's an even playing field. Right. The traditional and the alternative uh, doctors can each have their say, and we can go and, and listen to the arguments and read the research and decide for ourselves. Right. Yeah, I guess where it breaks down for me is the insurance part, because uh, yeah. uh, people don't even know that they are paying through the nose thousands and thousands of dollars extra that they shouldn't have to spend because of the extra cost layers on the medical system. Mm. And yeah. yet they are completely unable to think outside of the box and spend three, four hundred dollars a month on an alternative that would ultimately be a lot less expensive, but unfortunately not. Uh, We're getting there, Martin. Have faith. We're getting oh, there. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I paid for all of my care out of pocket. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm the worst case scenario for me. <laughs> I had to pay for everything that ever got me better. Mm. I've, I've had one trip to an emergency room when I chipped a bone in my elbow. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, great. So 
I want to tell people what they're going to experience here in the next little while, which is number one, we're going to give you a coupon that's going to get you free shipping on the products that are available at remedylink.com, which is Spencer's website. And so the products we're going to be telling you about, you can access directly there. And uh, I'm going to tell you now, the coupon is Enthusiast. Hope you can spell that. So when you go to remedylink.com, you will be able to get free shipping on the products. And we're going to get talking about the products really soon. The second thing is I want to tell you is that Spencer is very, very good at finding ways to restore wellness out of illness. And the principles that he uses are shared by most of us functional medical practitioners, which is the concept of resolution of the original cause, which in many cases is toxic burden or other malfunctions in the system. Mm. Shall we talk about that? Sure, sure. Okay, so, so the principles that Remedy Link is built upon. Let's talk about Remedy Link. How old is this? <sighs> well, I've been making products it's now for 19 years. I think the name Remedy Link isn't that old, but that's how long I've been uh, designing products for. And it started out making them for myself. And then um, some alternative doctors I knew said, would you make some for my clients? And then I found I really liked that. It was very satisfying to me uh, to solve the puzzles of what's going on. Uh, what we were doing was or where I started was looking at products or protocols that were really good, but people wouldn't want to do. Uh, so as an example, the first product I made was metacardium, uh, which is a magnesium-based EDTA chelation product as a suppository. And uh, chelation is great, but you can't take it orally because only 5% survives digestion. And not that many people people want to or have access to running uh, IVs into themselves. Um, I taught myself how to do it on my own arm. Uh, you know, that was a bit of a mess while I was learning. Uh, but when it's, you know, I was curious. Um, but uh, chelation is fantastic. And there were just not a lot of people doing it. And 15, 19 years ago, even if you wanted to get an IV of it, there weren't that many doctors that would do it. So I wanted to make it available to people in their homes. Uh, I've made a slight change from the way it's typically done. Uh, most chelators are disodium EDTA uh, or calcium disodium EDTA. Now the disodium burns, so that's not used so much. Calcium disodium. The challenge with that is calcium's already on the EDTA, so it can't pull up more calcium. And we're not just trying to pull out heavy metals with EDTA, we're trying to pull out dystrophic calcium, calcium that's in the arteries, in the kidneys, in the, in the muscle tissue. That's a good part of the benefit of the anti-aging part of chelation. So I designed a magnesium and potassium EDTA so that it would give the minerals that we need, the magnesium and potassium, but still have the ability to grab onto calcium. Uh, the other thing which I only recently figured out is uh, how to deal with the concept of my mercury redeposition. Now, uh, of the three main chelators for mercury, you have DMSA, DMPS, and EDTA. And all three will grab mercury, and it makes a pretty good bond. But it will let, they will all let go of mercury for one or two other metals, depending on which chelator, perhaps chromium or oxidized iron. So what can happen is the EDTA goes in the body, or whichever chelator you're using, grabs mercury, takes it from one place, maybe that's not such a problem, maybe uh, sequestered in a fat cell somewhere, and then lets go of it when, it's, when it bumps into something it has a greater affinity for, and maybe releases the mercury someplace worse, like near a nerve or in the brain. And that's the backfires you hear at DMPS and DMSA, not so much with EDTA, but still possible. Right. Because the mercury is moving to places that were worse. And so I'm thinking, well, gosh, how do we deal with this? And then I found out that selenium makes an incredibly strong bond with mercury. Uh, elemental mercury will bond with selenium as uh, mercury selenide, or mercury selenide, and methylmercury, two methylmercury groups will bind to selenium as 
bismethyl mercuric selenide. So what I did is I, hey, that's a mouthful, right? Yeah. So I added some selenium to the metacardium, and now my hope is that in the event that you have someone who has a mercury load, who also has these other metals, which trigger the mercury to come off the EDTA, it will then be mopped up by the selenium. So I feel that was a, a major move forward because that's um, mercury redeposition has been a huge problem in the detox field, and I think yeah. this might be a solution for it. Yeah, I want to just butt in with a quick little story. Yes, I, I was toxic with mercury. I had a mouthful of amalgams, and I was just in trouble. And and I took some homeopathics, potent, wonderful stuff. And mm -hmm. indeed, it did just what you're saying. It just kicked up the uh, where wherever it found it. It just went into circulation, but it gave me this sensation that I was. It it felt like sense of unreality. It's as mm -hmm. if I were walking around with a glass dome over top of myself. Metals will, will do that. I mean, the story Mad as a Hatter from um, Alice in Wonderland is because hatters used to use mercury as the felt process. So metals will cause a lot of um, psychological issues for people. Yeah. As example, um, copper IUDs, which are uh, not so common in the US, and very common in Britain and the Netherlands, um, will leak copper into the uterus of the woman. That's actually how they work. They poison the uterus with copper. And um, I have a very close friend who went slowly mad over the course of six months from a copper IUD. And it happened so gradually, she never figured it out. But once we pieced it together, she's like, oh my God, yes, I'm mood swings and feelings of doom and uh, headaches and um, anemia. And we gave her some, well, we, we got the, the IUD out of her. And we gave her some chelation and 12 hours, maybe less, the lights came on and she turned to me and she said, I didn't realize how out of balance I'd become until I finally got it out of me. And then I'm, now I'm looking back and I realized, oh my God. And so please, if, if you or someone you know has a copper IUD, and this won't happen for every woman. Um, if a woman has, a, you know, it's, it's different. But if you have a friend or you yourself have a copper IUD, take a look at the symptoms for copper toxicity. If they match what you got, that might be the cause of a lot of your problems. Right. Ha. Huh. And so what I wanted to say is that I was not taking the selenium then. Oh. And I had this stuff going on, and I was, I mean, it got even funnier. I lost the ability to tell whether, for example, I was urinating or not. Oh my gosh. I remembered that I was standing at the stall in my suit. This was in my corporate uh, tie and suit job. And, you know, just doing the thing. Anyway, I was sure I was finished. So I um, shake, zip up. Oh no, I wasn't finished. It was still running. Oh gosh. And so there I go into the boardroom meeting with my, oh. uh, you know, <laughs> splat, all, coming with a towel. So sorry. <laughs> wow yeah anyway, that's sort of that's sort of comedy right <laughs> you have a, you have a um, you have a good perspective on it right well at the moment it was really weird and uh, anyway what I discovered was that I actually could use zeolite mm. back then and it's a similar sort of a tool it's capable of mopping up these uh, mercury or yes. and a few other things but it's well, it has a sketchy reputation, so uh, if we can do that with your metacardium with selenium, hey, more power to us. Uh, the only thing I would say is, and I'm, I, I'm thrilled that zeolite's hitting the market. Um, my, what, my concern is that if it's a zeolite that wasn't lab created, meaning it might also have some metals in it from the ground where it came from, there may be some evidence that if someone has a good enough digestion that the pH of the stomach might displace some of the metals in the zeolite out, which means it's not gonna happen for everybody. And I really look forward to um, the research coming out so I can, uh, showing that zeolite can be, uh, is, 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 um, is a way to go because yeah. uh, it's a much less expensive ingredient than EDT. Okay. Yeah, well, and, it's going to be hard to see that research for the reasons that we just discussed moments ago, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know. But, okay, great. So, so there's Remedy Link, the company mm. that you're running. You have 
about seven or eight products now. Yeah, we have, I think, uh, nine products that are listed. And then there's always a few that are in the pipeline that I'm All right. thinking about and trying to decide if uh, there's something that people okay. would be interested in. Well, let's do a little run through that. Sure. sure. So you started about metacardium. So right. I use the metacardium because I want it to detox heavy metals. Hmm. Correct? What symptoms uh, I, would I want to display to say, oh, I want this? So um, EDTA is for metal tox uh, is used with metal toxicity. And if it's a calcium-free EDTA, like uh, one that has a magnesium potassium, like what I use, our, a calcium-free EDTA also has the ability to decalcify tissue. Um, so hardening of tissues. Yeah, and that's something that happens to everyone as they get older. It's just part of the aging process. Um, certainly anyone that has exp uh, occupational exposure to metals, but nowadays everybody's got some in them. Oh, I'm, so, I'm driving in town and I'm inhaling the brake pad dust from the car ahead of me. Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, if we're prepared to change the oil in our car every 5,000 miles, I don't think it's unreasonable once a year to clean the metals out. So would uh, you say one box of metacardium once a year is a good policy? I would personally say that that um, once a year, someone who is not trying to decalcify tissue and someone that doesn't have occupational exposure, the average person, sure, that's a nice uh, spa day for your, for your body. You could say it's a good detox. All right. Okay, so anyone with hardening of the arteries, that means high blood pressure is a sign of that. Well, um, I'm not a doctor and it's not a drug, so I can't say that it would be for hardening of the arteries, but I can say that, um, well, we are I, here what I can tell you, when I had, I have a lot of heart disease in my family and I take metacardium and when I got tested, um, I had the heart of a 25 year old. Right. So, well, I'm allowed to make structure and function claims. Right. What right. FDA supports. And if I tell you that this will soften hardening arteries, that's a function claim. I think we're safe to say that. Uh, I will let you make. I will let you say that. I will. I will err on the side of more caution. Okay. Well, I will let your doctor decide whether he can tell you that you have that illness. But yes, you decide. Okay. okay. Got it. Okay. So metacardium for that. Yeah, uh, metacardium. I would use if I were dealing personally with metals or calcifications for me. All right. Awesome. So the next one that we have that I'm personally really fond of is the glycamines. Ah, uh, yes. So that is a remake. Uh, so in the same way that I wanted to make chelation available to people who didn't, who didn't want to do needles, I wanted to make a liver gallbladder flush available. Now, the, the old style way of doing this is to take a half a cup of olive oil to stimulate bile and then uh, Epsom salts to dilate the sphincter of odi, the little ring muscle at the bottom of the gallbladder that opens it up and then give birth to a bunch of stones. And, yeah. You know, this is a heroic way to do it. And if I were looking at trying to avoid uh, gallbladder surgery in four days, sure. But if you have a little more time, um, I think it's nicer to do it a little more gradually. I like to melt them out personally. Right on. And, well, uh, well, we have, we have on our website a couple of recipes for doing this gallbladder flush. Yes. And people do it. I've done it. It's, um, it's a little bit like trying to give birth. Yes. Not totally like that, but sort of like that. Because you're trying to push things through an opening that's not meant to have yeah. that size pushed through it. Yeah, I've done, those, I've done the liver gallbladder flush myself. Um, I think if you want to do it, it's much better to first soften and break down the stones as much as possible uh, before you do that. Um, but the, the challenge I would say is that it doesn't address why the stones were there. It will flush the gall, the bile, the sludge, and, and, but it won't get to the causal layer. And part of that has to do with all the chlorinated water we're exposed to. The body needs to get rid of that with glycine and taurine con uh, peptide conjugation. Uh, so we end up with glycine and taurine deficiencies, and glycine and taurine are the building blocks of bile. So I think that's part of what's going on. I think the uh, people who are on a low-fat diet, which I believe is a mistaken idea, 
um, who aren't giving the, the liver the continual stimulation to produce bile and stay moving, also that contributes to the kind of hardening and sludging effects. Um, there's some evidence that nanobacteria can be the seeds for these stones. Uh, I, so what we did with the glitamins was we said, okay, liver gallbladder flushes are vitally important. Uh, how can we do this a little bit more gracefully? Uh, now, a suppository goes up against one of, uh, goes, is right up against three veins in that area. One of them is the portal vein, it goes right to the liver. So suppositories are a great way to access the liver. So when you put things in a suppository, one of the places it'll go is right to the liver. And so we use those things, uh, Chanka Pietra is one of my favorites, uh, for supporting the liver and dealing with uh, the clogging, uh, supporting the liver and dealing with uh, resolving the stones, but also giving it the building blocks to make bile in the first place. And uh, I think it's before someone does a detox, um, the, you've heard the term a healing crisis or um, a Herxheimer reaction. Um, that happened to you, with all the mercury going everywhere. I think when someone's getting a healing crisis, what's gone on is they haven't cleared the channels for detox first. So the water-soluble toxins have to come out the urine, so the kidneys have to be clear. Uh, you know, BUN creatinine ratio and no calcified kidneys. And the fat soluble toxins are going to come out the liver and the gallbladder and the bile. So, what I like to do first if I'm detox, if I'm uh, doing a detox, is do the glitamins and the metacardium so I know the glitamins first, so I know that the liver gallbladder is moving as clear as possible. The same ingredient, Chanka Piedra, that has, um, that is associated with, uh, uh, working with gallstones also has an effect with kidney stones. So I like the glitamins first to open up the water-soluble and fat-soluble pathways, then go in there with the metacardium for metals and say the, the uh, Xenoplex for chemicals and that kind of thing. And uh, also I think uh, the lymphatic system is overlooked. It's good to get the lymphatic system too because that can also can get uh, a little sludgy. Right. So, okay, so you mentioned the um, Xanaplex, which, mm. of course, that's the ongoing continuous liver support, right? Yes. Uh, it's not something I would do every day. It's, um, no. Right. The, uh, so that is a remake of two different protocols that I thought really should be done together. Uh, it's organic coffee and glutathione. Now, organic coffee, as a suppository, uh, acts like a coffee enema. And the way a coffee enema works is it stimulates an enzyme in the liver called glutathione S transferase, whose job it is to attach glutathione to the chemical toxin. Now, if you give someone a coffee enema and they don't have enough glutathione in their body, it's going to be limited in its effect. And you could actually backfire them a little bit. You might end up uh, just stimulating too much phase one, not enough phase two, and, and making it temporarily more toxic for a person. So if you're going to do a coffee enema, it's really good to have glutathione in the system, but a lot of us don't, and the reason is it's already been used up dealing with the toxins we've been exposed to. So most people are, you know, their tanks bottomed out on the glutathione. Now, glutathione, like EDTA, will not survive digestion more than, say, 5%. It's a tripeptide. So glutathione is given by IV, but I put it in the suppository, so that it hits at the same time as the coffee. And <clears throat> this reminds me of a story I'd like to tell you about oh, how I fell in love with glutathione. I was living in Hawaii at the time, and uh, my next door neighbor was a very famous painter. And he comes over and says, uh, Spencer, I know you're into detox. Can you help my friend? I said, well, sure, Jan, I could try. What, what's going on? He goes, well, uh, he, he was at a work site and opened a refrigerator and drank what he thought was a glass of water. I said, what did you really drink, Jan? He says, industrial solvent. And I said, how much did he get him? He goes, I don't know, but he's uh, maybe uh, enough that he's in trouble. Well, they went to the, they went to the obviously, so I followed up and I, I uh, sent a message to the, the fellow. I said, uh, if you're still alive, um, here's what you could do. Um, go and get some glutathione by IV 
and find a, find a way to get it into you. Find a way to get glutathione into you because glutathione is good for solvents because the hospital couldn't do much for him. And I said, I don't care. You know, it doesn't matter how you get it in. Find a nurse, find a doctor, find a veterinarian, find a junkie. Find someone who can get a needle. And again, I'm not giving him medical advice. What I'm saying is, this is what I would do for me. I would get the glutathione in one way or the other. And this is how much I would use for me. And um, a week goes by, I don't hear anything. So I'm thinking the guy's dead. You know, you drink industrial solvent, that's, you know, you're unconscious in the hospital. You're probably not coming back. And if you do, probably brain dead. Anyway, a week goes by and I get a phone call. And uh, it's this fellow. And he goes, uh, is this Spencer? And I'm like, yes. He goes, I'm the fellow who, who had the, the um, accident poisoning from the solvents. And I'm, going, I'm like, well, we're having a conversation. That's very good. Yeah, that's <laughs> he, goes, it. he goes, yeah, well, my wife got the glutathione into me. And in the chair, I mean, I was, he said that when he was in the chair, he was basically almost comatose. Yeah, just leaving, right? That was it. He was, he was, he was, he, that was pretty much gone. And boom, the lights came on and he was able to turn around. And I thought, my God, this stuff's amazing. Why didn't they give it to him in the hospital? See, they should have this for, for mushroom poisoning, for, for poisoning cases. Any poisoning. Any poisoning. Glutathione is great for metals and chemicals. I like to use it for chemicals. I like to use EDTA for metals because I want to spare the glutathione for the chemicals. I want it to be able to focus. So that was the beginning of my love affair with glutathione. So, so let me just pause here. So if somebody has volatile organic compound poisoning at pretty much anything, whether it's a benzene, NAFTA, formaldehyde, you name it, pretty much? There is a long list of chemical toxins which glutathione will conjugate. Um, of all the detox pathways, you know, peptide conjugation, glucuronidation, sulfur, um, glutathione seems to be the, the, the most all-around beneficial way to go. Um, there may be individual toxins that will not conjugate to glutathione and you would need a different pathway. Uh, certain hormones, for instance. But for the kind of things that you and I are exposed to on a daily basis, glutathione. So this is the toxic house situation, right? It's the carpet gassed off, the uh, gyp rock or whatever, sheet rock from China gassed off, and so on. Those yeah, are the new car smell, the pla you know, all of the, the plastic leaching out of the food wrappings, uh, all the things that they don't have to tell you that are in the food and, you know, because they have some special uh, law that gets them away from listing it on their ingredients. The, the BPA from the receipts. Oh. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff glutathione is good for. Okay, great. So that's in Xenoplex. Uh, Xenoplex is glutathione plus the organic coffee because again, it's not enough for either of them to be there. You have to have the, the effect of the coffee enema and the glutathione at the same time for the magic to really happen. And so the usage, if I were to uh, suggest one a week, ongoing? Uh, more? So uh, what I do is I have it, let's say I had an acute exposure. Let's say I, um, and I used to have multiple chemical sensitivities. They're almost entirely gone now. Uh, let's say I had been caught behind uh, a truck that had a diesel and I was driving and I didn't get the recycle button pressed fast enough and I didn't have the fan filter on in my truck and I started feeling, you know, all those symptoms, the tightness of the chest, the, the, you know, the nausea. I would take one uh, every eight hours until personally I felt better. Um, in terms of uh, how often I would do it uh, as a general thing, again, it's occupational. Uh, if I we're dealing with, um, let's say I worked at a, uh, a dry cleaning facility and I was exposed to the solvents that they use. I would probably uh, take one every three days the rest of my life if that were me. If I just had a regular life, wasn't greatly exposed to chemicals, um, I might do a one box a year just as a nice cleanse, you know. At the same time I was taking the metacardium, I might alternate them. Okay, great. Well, which one would you like to talk about next? Well, let's see. Endosterol? Uh, sure, I could talk about endosterol. Uh, so an older friend of mine uh, asked me if I could make a product for the prostate. He said, well, the prostate's right there. 
kind of like next door to where you were there. Put it. And I said, well, sure, let me look into it. Now, having said that, personally, I find the metacardium was great for my prostate. The, the prostate, <clears throat> uh, it's got this very labyrinth kind of construction, so it tends to calcify and get infections that are very difficult to get out and then inflamed. So uh, when you're dealing with the prostate, uh, one is I want to decalcify it personally. I want to deal with the infections that may be in it. Uh, and then the, the swelling, but then also there's something else that happens to men. And that is as we age, uh, our levels of aromatase and 5-alpha reductase go up and we start turning estrogen into DHT, which is hair loss, and uh, estrogen. We actually become feminized. So if it weren't enough that we have a feminizing culture and that we have um, gender bending chemicals, xenoestrogens in the food and water supply, by the time a man is 50, he's often making more estrogen than testosterone. Uh, this is why you see men uh, have lost a lot of, a lot of men will have lost their drive, their initiative, their spark uh, at that point because they're more feminine than masculine. Yeah, the andropause symptoms of the uh, easy to anger but hard to motivate. Yeah, and the fat around the belly and the loss of muscle tone and the, all the things that happen. So uh, that was designed with the intent of uh, help, uh, supporting the body in having a healthier prostate, but also uh, changing the, uh, getting back to the healthy testosterone estrogen ratio. And I remember the first time I took it, um, I was with my kids and we were going on a hike and boy, they just couldn't keep up with me. I was running up and down hills. It just felt, it felt great. Fantastic. So what does endosterol do for a woman? Well, that's interesting you'd ask. <laughs> um, what's not often recognized is a lot of the plants, a lot of the herbs that are helpful for the male reproductive system are great for the female reproductive system. It, tings, it brings blood to the same area. So uh, we've had women who have told us that they have got improvement uh, in some feminine uh, aspects with endosterol too, uh, although I'm not as well versed with that. Okay. I've heard from some clients that they had easier time with menstruation and that they've had an easier, what shall I call it, more motivation toward uh, libido, I don't know, just more interested in intimacy. Because it's bringing blood back into that area and normalizing hormones, yeah. Right, that. But that's not the only thing that endosterol does, right? There are some other things in there that... Uh, there are some uh, ways in which it works with peroxisomes in terms of uh, dealing with certain type of toxins, but um, mostly what I use it with would be uh, for men who are over 50, who might be losing some drive um, or uh, having some, needing some prostate support. Okay, because I saw some things in it that suggest that it will work on the, uh, what shall we call it, uh, NRF2 pathways of uh, helping the body sort out normal cells from not normal cells, something to do with apoptosis, that sort of thing? I think apoptosis would be more for the elagica. Okay, so never mind. So okay. I'll leave it at that. So Do you want to talk about apoptosis? It's an interesting talk. Well, okay, so let's just wrap up on endosterol. Sure. So again, so we want to use it for people who are in declining hormonal balances, mm -hmm. who feel that they would like to get some pep back into their step. Uh, or whose um, pelvic fun function isn't what it used to be, yeah? I think that uh, endosterol is a great support for uh, people with, uh, uh, for that part of the body, yeah. Great. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so let's, let's talk about Elagica. Now, Elagica is different because that's not a suppository, right? Right. So I only make suppositories if either the location is important, prostate, liver, or if the ingredient will be destroyed by digestion. So the Elagica story is um, my, uh, my son was uh, visiting relatives. He was 3,000 miles away. He was maybe five at the time. And he comes to, uh, he was with his mother and she calls and says, you know, our son's not feeling well, what do we do? And I'm like, gosh, I'm not there. I, I can't really determine if it's a virus, if it's a bacteria. It could even be a parasite, although that's unlikely. 
Um, I don't know. And it bothered me that I, I wanted um, a broad spectrum that I could use for everything. So I started thinking and I started looking and I bumped into this uh, ingredient called elagic acid, which you find uh, in a lot of plants, specifically in raspberry seeds. <clears throat> Although to get a, enough of it to do something, you'd be eating kilos of raspberries. But so I'm, I'm researching elagic acid and it starts to, I'm, I'm finding for bacteria, it will affect the uh, enzyme gyrase, which is what lets bacteria DNA to coil. So it causes the bacterial DNA to unspool, which <laughs> means that the bacteria doesn't do very well. Then I found for viruses, it would interfere with the integrase enzyme, which is one of the enzymes that uh, viruses use to penetrate the cell wall so they yeah. can get replicated. Yeah, that's their little beak. Right. Yeah. And, and then I found out it would suppress chitin synthase, uh, oh. which is the enzyme uh, fungi use to build their cell wall. And I thought, wow, this is amazing stuff. I want to take this every day. And then I found out that it was an uh, apoptotic inducer. And what that means is um, cells, when they get old or damaged, um, they're supposed to commit, uh, they're supposed to self-destruct. Uh, it's a safeguard against cancer because cells that get damaged and don't self-destruct become, can become growths. And the body, this process where a cell self-destructs is called apoptosis or apoesis, depending on where you went to medical school. Uh, elagic acid has been shown to support apoptosis. Wow, this stuff is amazing. I found one downside to it, and that was elagic acid would make blood get thicker. It would coagulate blood. And I didn't want to um, get all those benefits at the risk of stressing out the cardiovascular system. Yeah. So what I did is I researched exactly which pathway the elagic acid was using. I think it's Hageman factor, factor 12, I think, uh, that it was causing the blood to coagulate in. And I mixed in some plant matter, some herbs, that had some research behind them that they would uh, uh, support uh, healthy blood viscosity. And I put that in with the elagic acid and put them in as a capsule, and uh, it's really great stuff. Um, it, I think, gets you about halfway there. Um, and I can tell you about the other half, but if you have any questions, I'll talk to you about a lot. We'll, well, no, let's, let's have the other half, because... Well, okay. We're... The other half is actually a different product. Okay, so no, okay. Let's, let's wrap this. So, okay, so the reason I want to take this then, if I'm concerned about my aging, because I want to rejuvenate, refresh, re... well, just shut off all the garbage cells that are hanging around and shouldn't. So I'm, I'm having some abnormal growths. I'm having these spots on my skin here and there, or who knows what's going on on the inside, right? So I well, want to shut off. It, there's a couple of different things. For rejuvenation, I, I'm, I don't know that I would say elagic acid is rejuvenating. <laughs> and, for the, and for the accumulation of the spots, the lipofuse skin, um, DMAE might be more effective for that. But um, what I would say is, um, you know, humans are very, once a person hits, how do I say this? Okay, so there's different risks at different decades of life. For instance, um, right. you know, car crashes in your 20s, heart attacks in the 50s, cancer in 60s. Uh, lung and kidneys in the 80s and 90s, Alzheimer's. Um, and I think that uh, giving the body some support in its apoptosis system once we hit 50, I think is, um, is wise. I'll, I'll phrase it that way. Beautifully put. Okay. Okay, and so, okay, we're putting it on the side of the preventive. Okay, you're saying, never mind. Um, never mind the word that we're not supposed to use, and I'm going to disclaim it here. I am not suggesting that if you have cancer diagnosis that we are telling you to buy three bottles of Elagica. But it is known that Elagic Acid is the supplement that helps to turn a wayward cell back to not being wayward or shut it off. You know, um, we could talk about cancer for a moment. Uh, first off, when we have um, chronic toxicity, so we have chronic toxicity, it accumulates in the tissue that's genetically the weakest, it lowers the cell voltage of those cells so that all of the composting microbes that we eat that normally pass through us as spore and eggs are triggered to wake up and colonize us because we look like compost material to them. Um, 
because of the low cell voltage. The body then tries to deal with that. It becomes a chronic wound and the body keeps trying to repair it for quite some time. In order to repair a chronic wound, you need to differentiate, you need to create, you need to multiply and create new cells. And I'm of the opinion that in some cases, cancer is triggered by these chronic unresolved wounds because what cancer is in the simplest form is a cell that won't turn off its replication cycle. Cells should be off and on. And when they get stuck in the on position and they keep multiplying, that's cancer. So I think that there are a lot of signals we get in our bodies to put cells in the on position. There's chronic wounds to multiply to fix the wound. Um, there's all the radiation, the cell phones. Well, which, there's, there's your injury, constant yeah. repeated micro injury. Yeah, yeah. And it's not like there's enough energy in a cell phone to cook an egg, but the frequency that it's at is such that it can get cells to stay in the on position more than the off. Or so I've read, I haven't personally done the research. So what I would say is um, once, you, once I hit, for me personally, at 50, that's my line in the sand where I say, okay, now I need to start being more preventative and start not just doing something yearly, but maybe a little more often to deal with some of the things that might be coming down around the curve at me. Okay. Uh, one last word about cancer, and this is just my personal opinion. Um, I think cancers are, they're, they're very, um, they can evolve very quickly. They can respond, they can adapt, they're adaptive. So uh, what I would do is I would pick, say, 12 protocols, 12 remedies. Uh, it can be a bit overwhelming if someone's looking on the internet for what to do with cancer. A thousand things will show up. So were it me, I would pick 12 things that I like and do four of them at a time, but every week or two weeks, rotate one out. So I'm changing it. So I don't give the cancer the time to adapt. Uh, I learned that um, from the Hammond brothers, who are two great uh, doctors out, um, in the South, and I think it's very wise. I want to pass that on. Okay. <clears throat> Got it. And so as far as the use of the Elagica, this is in capsules. I think it's 90 capsule to the bottle. Yeah. So what do we do with that? Three a day? Uh, for me, at 49 turning 50, I might do, you know, a capsule every two or three days. Just, just, a, just a single capsule? Just one. one or, unless maybe I had a familial history of, of things I didn't want in my body. Uh, I would say one or two, once or twice a week. I think that's enough if it's maintained to give the body some good support. Okay. And if you're Angelina Jolie, you take three? Oh, oh yeah, with the surgeries, my heart goes out to that one. Well, no, that's, that's, uh, yeah. If she heard of you, if she talked to you before she went and had herself altered. We would have had a conversation about epigenetics. Right. We would have. Yeah. About how your genes are not your destiny, that just because you have bad genes does not mean that they will be activated. Right. That based on your lifestyle, your genes can be silenced or activated. Right. So don't be so afraid about bad genes in your family mm -hmm. history. You, if you live, if you don't turn those genes on, yeah, they're not going to bother you. Right. I, it's it's a f strange conversation, right? It's talking about genes is like talking about light light switches in your house. I like to say that it's similar to the the eggs and spores of parasites and yeast that mostly. If the environment's not correct, they pass through without a problem. Mostly bad genes, if they're not activated, won't cause a problem. There are some parasites and, and fungi and bacteria that are very aggressive that will cause problems to anyone. There are some genes that will cause problems to anyone. But mostly, I'm of the opinion, we can manage our genetics epigenetically by our internal environment and lifestyle. Right on. Okay, so understood. So now that we're at that end, we should probably talk about Limplex because that's totally related to the, to the sewage system that deals with all of this material flowing through us or staying within us. Right, so most people will probably remember when they're young having some little bumps on the back of their neck or in their, in their inguinal region by the, by the, in the groin. Um, so 
the lymphatic system is actually by volume larger than the bloodstream, the blood system. And it works, it doesn't have a pump per se, so in order to move lymphatic fluid, we have to move our muscles. And it is what washes the toxins away from cellular metabolism. So when cells burn fat and glucose and create uh, metabolites. metabolites and end products, and they leave the cells, it's the lymphatic system that washes it away like a tide. And I keep using the aquarium as a metaphor. Hmm. If the cells were the fish, the water in the aquarium is like the lymphatic fluids. Yeah. And that fish eats the food you throw in the aquarium and it poops right back into that same fluid. Yes, and if you don't clean the, fil the, the water, the fish dies. Right. If there's no fil circulating filtration, yes. you poison it and the fish goes belly up. Yeah, I, I have been practicing and also telling others, you need vertical movement against gravity. Hmm. Down. Walking yeah. does it, right? Like if you could visualize a shaker, well, here it is. Here's my prop. I'm, I'm shaking the bottle and the fluid goes up and down against it, right? And this is yeah. how I need to move the fluid in the body. So I have to be walking, jogging, or bouncing on a mini trampoline or some such. That's one of the reasons why um, massage feels so nice. It moves lymphatic fluid. Ah, yes. I can't, I can't help but feeling joyful when I get off the trampoline mm. because there's oxygen reaching my cells. Yes, yeah. But anyway, so back to... So um, when I started thinking about how to deal with healing crises and clearing out the channels, I, you know, I come across the lymphatic system with all of its circulation. And so I wanted to find some way to give the lymph a little bit of stimulation, to tighten the junctions, to, to thin the lymph, to stimulate it to move. And I came up with, I think it's 10 herbs that were very effective for it. Um, you probably already know of most of these, uh, echinacea for instance. Um, so uh, what I noticed is the first time I took the product myself when I was experimenting, I could feel all my lymph nodes light up. They got kind of warm and tingly. I was like, wow, what's that? And uh, what I've come to understand is that um, a lot of us still have junk stuck in our lymph nodes from unresolved infections. And when you clear it out, you can feel something there or in the tonsillar ring. So uh, I think part of a good detox protocol would be to go through one bottle of Limplex and you don't need the whole bottle. Yeah, I would take, you know, maybe uh, six and see how I felt. And if I notice something, I might consider that for me an indication I could take some more. And if I were to do that, maybe, uh, maybe six, and I did that for maybe a day or two, and I would do that maybe once a year, just as a, a general flush through of the system. Like, uh, like you treat the drains of your, of your sewer on a regular basis to keep everything moving. Yeah, and the Limplex is a capsule uh, product, right? It is, it is. Again, 90 to the bottle? Yes, but it's, it's too strong to do more than, you know, just a little while. It's very powerful. So that bottle will probably treat the whole family? Uh, it would last a long time. Yeah, great. Beautiful. Well, so we're making our way through this. Now, one of your newer babies, which impressed the daylights out of me, well, actually, I'm going to bracket something in here. I got four products all at once. I took the Medicardium, Xenoplex, Endosterol, and Vitamins. And uh, on the box, it says, use one every third day. I thought, I don't have time for this. So I just rotated it. I used one from every box every day ongoing. That's why I say every third day, because I know there's people like you and me that are going to triple the dosage. So, <laughs> And it was entertaining. Yeah. All right. So you have still two more products on your site that didn't, we didn't talk about. Do you want to? Sure. We have uh, Zoiben. Yeah, we have Zoiben. And, okay, let's talk about it. Okay. And then there's one that's not on the, not on the site yet that I can tell you about, too. Okay. The, the Zoiben is um, German for... Uh, purge or cleanse. And, uh, you know, uh, we've all read Holder Clark and about parasites being problems. Uh, the challenge is um, most of the antiparasitic agents I took, uh, the plant-based bitter ones, the bitter materials, they're toxic. They're mildly toxic to humans. 
toxic to the kidneys, to the liver, to the nerves. And uh, so is it worth killing the parasite if we're also hurting ourselves? So I started thinking about this and I wondered, well, why is it that a human body is so good at dealing with viruses and bacteria, but terrible at fungi and parasites? What did they, what's going on with that? And this is what I think is going on. Uh, parasites have been around for half a billion years, fungi for 2.4 billion years. They've had a long time to figure out just through brute force evolution and mutation how to mess with animals. Plants have been evolving with these for the same amount of time, and they're also susceptible to being parasitized and molds and fungi. So the plants have a defense. They've evolved. It's, they're essential oils. And I think what happened is animals knew that they could go into the, didn't know, but they intuited that if they would smell around the forest for something that had essential oils and ate that, it could deworm them. It could deal with the fungi. So I believe animals, of which we are, we're an animal, we have outsourced our defenses against fungi and parasites to the plant kingdom. To ingested stuff, yes. Eat, right. So we didn't need to develop an immune system that could handle these because if you're eating plants and getting essential oils, that takes care of it for you. Mm -hmm. Our modern diet doesn't have many essential oils because, uh, one, they can be very intense in flavor. Two, cooking makes them go away. Yeah, I'm, now, I'm keep thinking about the alteration of palate preferences too. Yes, yes. I'll, I'll get there in a second. Um, you know, 150 years ago and back, most of us were living on farms up until the beginning of the agricultural revolution. Uh, yes. The, yeah, you know, the, the Nile and so forth. Distance farming. Yes. And so it was known that you would deworm everyone in the house. The, how, the, the people, the pets, the livestock all got dewormed a couple of times a year. Now, we don't do that now because we believe we're not on a farm, we're not exposed, but 30% of people have Toxoplasmosa gondii in their brains. So we- 30%? 30% in the, in the United States have Toxoplasmosa gondii, which is, you get it from cats. And it affects behavior. Uh, it makes the mouse attracted to the urine of the cat so that it runs towards the cat and gets eaten. Then the, peck, the parasite continues its life cycle in the cat gut, and then the mouse goes and gets it from the feces of the cat. So it changes the behavior of the cat, but it, it also changes the behavior of humans. I believe a, a large number of people who have died in motorcycle crashes have huge amounts of Toxoplasmosa gondii. Maybe it's making them more foolhardy and more, uh, less risk averse, or more, more capable of taking risks. Mm -hmm. um, in any case, so we've, we're all, uh, a lot of us are heavily parasitized. I think in Brazil and France, it's 80% of people have that particular brain parasite. And sometimes parasites are tiny and microscopic and sometimes they're three foot long worms. Now, here's what they do. It's, it's uh, kind of diabolical. Parasites and fungi need the amino acids glutamine and glutamate and sugar. Glutamate is the savory flavor. Sugar is the sweet flavor. So they make us want what they need for their fuel source, glutamate and sugar. And then they make us dislike that which is bad for them, which is the bitter tastes. So most people say, I prefer sweet and savory and I don't like bitter. But is it them or is it the parasites and yeast talking? If you've got, you know, one indication of parasites is, you know, clenching teeth and, uh, nightmares and, and uh, things like that. And for candida, it's a, it's a coated tongue. But I think if you've got food cravings, that's a, great, that's a real strong indication. So uh, I wouldn't say stop eating sweets and savories. What I would say is if you start eating essential oils, the right kinds, you won't have the cravings. That doesn't mean you can't enjoy something sweet or savory, but you won't crave it. It'll be in front of you, it'll be nice. So will the, the vegetables, they'll all be delicious. So what I did was I, I looked at all the essential uh, oils and I, uh, there's hundreds of them. And I got rid of the ones that were toxic or sensitizing or made you feel funny if you went out in the sun, all those. And what I was left with was about a hundred. And then I said, of these hundred, which are the ones that are the most effective against 
fungi, parasites, and yeast. I got about eight of them. And I started taking them and things started changing. Um, my, I needed far less food because I wasn't feeding these hosts of things in me. I needed less sleep because uh, I wasn't having to repair the damage caused by them eating my tissue and going to the bathroom in my bloodstream. Uh, my mood got better and uh, some other things started changing in my digestion for the, for the better. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of black bile started coming out of me so I could tell that my liver was clearing out. I mean, I had stuff come out of me that even with all the other detox I had taken, it hadn't reached that, that got to something else. Um, so I think that having an ability to deal with parasites is um, fundamental to getting good health. And uh, the Zoibin product is designed around that idea. Uh, an interesting story is you, you probably know that propolis is one of those things that works for so many different kinds of conditions. But do you know where propolis comes from? Uh, pollen of, no, not pollen, sap of trees. It comes, exactly. It comes from the sap, um, the balsam, and the resin of trees. This is what the trees create to protect themselves. And the, the most famous saps uh, met, uh, historically for treating are uh, frankincense and myrrh. Oh, yes. And, so, and, and pine, pollen, pycnogenol, yeah. Yes, and then the pine in, the, in, uh, in Europe and in the Americas, we would go to the pine tree saps to distill out the pine sap to get the, uh, the pinenes and, the, and all of the essential uh, oil aspects. So what I did is I took, and so that's what propolis is. It's, it's the bee outsourcing to the trees protection of the hive. Yeah, that's beautifully deducted, you know. This is, this is not well put anywhere. This is the first time I hear it put like this anywhere actually understanding that nature does this and just, I use the word grok, grokking this concept of how this is all put together. I'm, I'm impressed. An egg and a spore is much more resistant to uh, the environment. So as long as I can make the environment such that they think it's not a good place to wake up and grow, they'll stay dormant in those forms because it's when they're growing that they, uh, they're susceptible. They're vulnerable in their growth state. Yes. So, right. So the deal is right. Once they pop, yes, it's yeah, vulnerable. That's right. Vulnerable. So I want to make a deal with these things. You can have my body when my body is dead, and I let them know my body is not dead by clearing out scar tissue and by taking enough essential oils that I am perceived as fully alive and not a suitable environment for growth. Right on. I think the idea of killing them is mistaken. We're not sterile and neither is our environment. The idea is to harmonize with them and get them to want to stay dormant. Right, so stay hostile, have high, have high mineral values, I don't know what you call it, total dissolved solids, right? Be, mm -hmm. be well mineralized, have high electric values, be the yeah. voltage of the cells, right? Yes. It's to be at the minus 25 millivolt or better. Yes. All that. And then we won't be colonized by these things. It, it won't even be a fight anymore because they themselves will decide. It's much better to get someone else to decide to do something they want to do than to force them. Mm -hmm. So the same with these things. Let them decide they don't want to be around, that right, they right. want to go back to sleep. Yeah. This is the Star Wars trick. <laughs> These are not the. <laughs> <laughs> well, well said. Yeah. These are not the embryos you're looking for. This is not the body you're looking for. Yeah, right. move along. <laughs> okay, perfect. And so, okay, so this uh, Zoeben, how do we use this? Is this a suppository? No, no. This is because um, I want to do the entire digestive tract. Okay. So uh, what I what I like to do uh, is to mix a little bit. A teaspoon is is uh, enough. Uh, in some soda water, seltzer water, and then drink it down. So and that's it. I do that. It's actually powder. Uh, no, it's an essential oil liquid. They're, they're oh. all, right. So it's the oil, it's the resin from frankincense. It's the oil of frankincense. It's the oil of myrrh, oregano, uh, clove, oil from pine. It's all of those great uh, essential oils that were 
be living naturally as hunter gatherers and eating only fresh food and raw mostly, out the, then we would be getting this normally. But we don't. We cook our food. It's been sitting on a shelf somewhere before we even got to it. The essential oils are all gone. And then we say, well, why am I being colonized? Because you have convinced these things that, that you're a good environment for that. Well, you can tell that I have not had this one yet because I don't even know that it's... So it's a liquid in a bottle, yes? Yeah. I would suggest starting it perhaps on a Friday when you don't have any plans for the weekend because um, interesting things can happen when... Uh, you will cleanse. Yes. Um, specifically, a parasite cleanse can have some um, interesting results. I would say that when your food cravings have cleared, when your tongue is clear, when you no longer got to get that beef jerky, MSG flavor, you know, barbecued ribs, when you no longer need to have that sugary treat, well, okay. Awesome. Okay, so the last one that we can see is known as the Notoplex. Notoplex, sure. <laughs> uh, noto from the Latin uh, scar. And oh. this, yeah, so this was my idea of how do I deal with scar tissue? Because unresolved scar, uh, scar tissue can become cancerous. And it's a, la it's a lack of function. So I want it out. Um, by the time, okay, so here's what happens with scar tissue. Yeah, last stage of these five stages of decline, right? Yes. First, it's the acute inflammation, then it's the yeah. chronic inflammation, and then it's the I give up and then there's the scar left behind, right? Yeah. So, you know, the chemicals and toxins lower the cell voltage further in typically weak tissue, which is where they accumulate. The composters come in and you get, and a person can get a, a chronic wound. And the body eventually says, I can't fix this, I'll make a scar over it. And then, and for some, in some cases, that scar becomes cancerous. <clears throat> but let's talk about the scar process a little bit. If you take a muscle sample of a young mouse and then a two-year-old mouse, that would be the equivalent of 80 for a human. In the young mouse, in one sample, you might see 20 healthy um, muscle cells. And um, in the older mouse, the 80-year-old equivalent, you could see 10 healthy cells, the rest is scar tissue. And of those 10 that are alive, really only six are vital. The other four are fading away on the way out. So by the time we're 80, you could say we're really half dead and quarter dying. So you're actually replacing, it's as if you are turning off out of the 10 fingers that I have here as I age, I keep turning off the usable ones, right? Right, and replacing it with scar tissue. Uh, now, in someone, in, some, in someone that has decent genetics, it happens kind of globally, no one place in particular. But if someone has a weak spot, then the scar tissue shows up more there. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of scar tissue because it's associated with 45% of all deaths and most chronic diseases. <clears throat> scar tissue in the lungs is uh, asthma, emphysema, COPD, and cystic fibrosis. In the vascular system and in, in the heart disease, it's uh, arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis and, and heart disease. In the uh, muscles, it's fibromyalgia. In the skin, scleroderma. In the uterus, fibroids. In the breasts, fibrocystic breasts. In the bladder, interstitial cystitis. In the nerves, MS. So it, it's a global phenomenon. And when we see someone who's got one of these conditions, what we're really seeing is someone that's got what I believe is uh, an, a chronic wounding of that system with scarring coming in. So it's important for me to figure out how do I deal with scarring? Because if I don't have good genetics, <clears throat> it's going to get me. And even if I do, globally, it's still going to occur. So <clears throat> one of the things I think that's best for scarring is an enzyme called serpentase. It's the enzyme that um, silkworms use to break out of their chrysalis, out of their cocoon. They digest their way out. Right. And uh, it turns out that the cocoon is like a scar. So if we take in serapeptase, we may be able to dissolve our scars. The challenge is serapeptase, like glutathione, like EDTA per chelation, it doesn't survive digestion. You get about 5%. 
which is amazing because you hear of great miracles of people taking serapeptase. Um, I just want to butt in here. We have been promoting for many years serratiopeptidase or serapeptase in products as a means of helping athletes not hurt after workouts mm -hmm. or other reasons, rejuvenation, just mm. undoing the fibrosis of the body. Mm. Yeah. And so we have taken, we have been sending it orally and here you are saying, but 95% of what you put through here is actually destroyed on the way through. So that's really an um, indication of how amazing serapeptase is that you can get 5% and still get those amazing results. So imagine if you get 95% absorption, well, then you can really go in and start doing some stuff inside the body. Now, you can also fast, and it's a lot easier if you don't have parasites to feed, and that will trigger auto, uh, autophagy and digestion of tissue, but uh, serapeptase is a great way to do it. It's um, a lot easier. Uh, you can do it and still eat and do all these other things. So the Notoplex product is the serapeptase in a very high amount, rectally, so that it's, so we have the absorption. We also put in iodine and selenium because iodine is associated with uh, scar formation, lack of healing, and selenium is associated with scars uh, turning into things we don't want. So Yeah, the mucosal barrier strength and all of that, yeah, permeability. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was a study I saw that said that when they gave selenium to people with growths in their body, the growths started looking more like scar material. So that tells me it's taking it backwards one step. So if we go from growths to scar, then from scar to chronic wound, then from chronic wound to proper healing, I think we're really moving in the right direction. Um, there's one other thing that's not on there, and that is, uh, you're familiar with the castor oil pack, yes? Hold on, just before we get to that, let's just finish on this notoplex. Sure. Which is, uh, so, Okay, if you have fibromyalgia, if you hurt all over and if you have bouts of, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, chronic pain at level seven and above days on end, hmm. how much of it do I take until That's it stops? That's a great question. That's a great one, question. One a day until it stops? I personally wouldn't have a problem taking one a day of serapeptase. Um, I suppose there's a possibility that it might be a little um, irritating to the mucosa every day. So I would say follow your intuition and how you're feeling about it. Uh, one of the things, like fibromyalgia, since you bring it up, when scar tissue gets laid down, little muscle fibers actually penetrate, get into the wound and tighten to approximate the wound to close. It's like little stitches. And then they're meant to dissolve afterwards. Now, fibromyalgia, someone has got scar tissue in their muscle connective tissue, it's stitched up and it never dissolved. So that's what all those tight muscles are. Yeah, They're actual it feels stitch. like corduroy, it feels like ropes. Yeah, it's actual stitching. It's muscle tissue that's tightened to stitch and never gone away. So that, you know, that's part of the issue with chronic um, scarring is it, it tightens everything up. Okay, so we, we have it here saying, Take as much as you can stand until your symptoms have receded. Right. I've never had a bad effect from it personally. I'm simply saying if you're asking what the outer edge is, if one took it every day at extended periods of time, could the serapeptase cause a little irritation possibly? Right. Yep. Great. Okay. So finally, well, before we even get there, I would like to bracket in a little bit of... Uh, what we haven't talked about is about the administration. Hmm. I like to, well, maybe we can put that in the end. Let's talk about the product that you wanted to uh, sure. talk about. Let's, let's hear what you have with the, uh, with the other pack. Sure. So this is the other side of Notoplex. Um, this is the transdermal way of working with scar tissue, uh, working with scar tissue. So again, it's my great love of these old school naturopathic cures and trying to make them more user friendly. So castor oil packs are great for scars internally. Um, and they're anti-inflammatory at 
at max, right? It's, it's yes, they call it Palma Christi, the hand of Christ, historically, because it was good for so many things. Uh, the challenge with a castor oil pack is it gets everywhere. Mm. Oil, oh. yeah. yeah, I've ruined clothes and sheets and beds with it. So what I've designed, and it's not ready yet, I'm still working on it, I hope to have it in a few weeks. Do you have a date? Oh, this, this thing will be up for years. Uh, I'd like to say that within, see I have to, all right, let me tell you, it, 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 of 20, somewhere four, four to eight weeks because I have to get some things custom manufactured for it. Okay. What I did was I'm having the these bandages, very big bandages, okay. larger than you can get in a store, with uh, adhesive on all four sides, so that you can place it on your body and so that the castor oil won't leak everywhere. Right. So I've turned the castor oil into a paste and added some things to accelerate the transdermal aspect of it. And the idea is to take this paste and you spread it on the, the um, oversized bandage and you put it on. Uh, kidneys, lungs, uterus, wherever the, wherever the issue is. And so we've got the notoplex working from the inside and the castroplex kind of coming from the outside, and then hopefully between the two of them, we can get some good effect with scar tissue. All right, so you think summer of 2018, this will be on the market? Well, um, nobody makes bandages the size I want, so I'm having to have them custom made, and I don't know how long that'll take, but hopefully no more than a few weeks. All right. But I prefer to uh, under-promise and over-deliver, so let's say two months. Okay, great. So the castor pack mm. is, is something that works. Normally, you would do that with heating it. Normally, what you would do is you would take a piece of flannel cloth, soak it in the oil, put it on, say, your liver, wrap mm. yourself in uh, saran wrap so that you don't oil everything else, and then you would put a heating pad on top of it, right? Like right. Electric or hot water bottle. Yeah. Similar idea? Yes, so the idea of what I'm trying to do with castor patch is um, I'm going to see if we can do it without a heating pad. I think a heating pad would be better if you have access to one. Well, a hot water bottle is not hard to make. Same, same. But my, I, my, my hope for it, and it depends on how good the adhesive is, is that you can, if you want, you know, put it on and sit up, maybe even walk. Okay. Um, use a hot pad of some sort if you're home, but then and you can also leave it on for an hour or two and go out and walk about during your day without fear of it leaking everywhere. Now, whether I'm able to actually make that happen or not, we'll find out, that's my goal. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, in closing, what we have not done is we haven't talked really about suppositories. Hmm. It's important to understand that to some people, it's kind of anti their religion hmm. because they don't think that inserting things rectally is a wonderful idea. Yeah. However, I, I want to speak on to that in, in this way is, and you can probably support that well, is uh, there are major ways how you can get stuff into the human body. Like if you <laughs> inject it intravenously, you're in. No barriers, you just plowed it in. The other common way we have is we put things under the tongue, which is sublingual. We try to absorb it through the soft tissues in the mouth. Mm. Or we spray it in the nose or in the lungs, inhale it. Mm -hmm. This pathway, the rectal pathway, is really effective. Mm. Right? I'm a huge fan of suppositories uh, for a couple of reasons. One is... Um, I've taught myself how to do IVs on myself, but even now that I can do it you know, easily, um, I don't like it. Um, <clears throat> the suppositories, let's compare them to nasal, sublingual, uh, transdermal. The issue I have with sublinguals is I always salivate so much when I've got them under that I end up swallowing it all. So I'm not the hugest fan for sublinguals. They work, but they work in thing. They work with things that um, are so concentrated and so potent that you only need micrograms from my perspective. Uh, the same is with the nasal spray. For instance, um, I take a lot of peptides as a nasal spray. Maybe one day I'll make a product for it. 
but I only need tiny, tiny amounts. So it's okay to do a spray on each side. I can hold that in. I couldn't possibly take a gram or two grams of material under my tongue or in my nose. So the IV is great for when I need to get a lot of, if you have to get a lot of stuff in, a whole bag of stuff in one, yeah, an IV, especially if you're in a hurry. But if you don't need to move that quickly and you don't need to do that much, suppository, I think, is the next best. Um, so nasal for things with very, very s small doses, suppository for things that you want to do in the, say, one to two gram range. Now, there's three veins in that area, uh, two for regular circulation and one for portal circulation. So it's a, uh, you get some first, um, some of it goes to the liver, which is great if you're trying to get there. Some of it goes to the general circulation. It's great for the prostate because the prostate is eight, you know, half an inch away. Um, the benefit I think of suppositories is from a manufacturing standpoint, um, when I put them in organic cocoa butter and seal them, no light gets to them, no oxygen. And if you keep them cool, they can last a long time. So the shelf life on these is fantastic. So if you buy something and don't get around to it for a little while, if it's in your fridge for six months, you're fine. <clears throat> uh, it's also um, relatively easy to use. Uh, once you get the hang of it, it's, you, know, you can insert it in yeah, uh, 10 uh, seconds. I would just say that the way I use them is I actually make them cold. So mm -hmm. I, I keep them in the freezer. Yeah. Yeah. And then I take the one I'm going to use. I usually just have my bowel movement, have my shower, and nice and clean. Well, I find the rectal opening and push the whole the thing is about the size of my pinky. Oh, not even that. Maybe yeah, that the first maybe the the first uh, knuckle well, and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, so I take that and I push it in. I think you need to push it past the sphincter in my yep. body. That means about past here with this finger. Mm -hmm. And once it's past the uh, sphincter, it's stable and it's going to melt there and stay there. And I've only had one accident when I accidentally had some gas and, uh, and it sprayed my underwear. Yes, so you have to keep in mind if you're going to use a suppository and you think you have gas, there's going to be, even if you do have gas, there could be some cocoa butter that comes out. Just get it bad. Go excuse yourself and go to the bathroom. Or, or just wear a liner. I just will go to the bathroom and then that'll be that. Yeah, yeah. okay. Anyway, it's once you get the hang of it, it's no big deal. And, yeah. uh, and it's effective and you get a lot for your money. You, get, you can put a lot in and it bypasses the digestive system, which is the key part of it. So for instance, the Elagiga, the Limplex, I make them as capsules. They're, the ingredients in, in those products survives digestion. Sometimes it's actually improved by it. The glutathione, the EDTA, uh, the serapeptase, catalase will not survive digestion, or if it does at 5%. So suppositories really shine for those kind of applications. All right. Awesome. Well, it's been a good long talk. Mm. And uh, so those of you who are still listening, let me remind you, you can buy it at life-enthusiast.com or you can get free shipping directly at remedylink.com with the uh, coupon enthusiast. Spencer, you are an amazing researcher and uh, a wonderful human being and I thank you so much for spending the time with us here today. Thank you for your kind words Martin. It's been a pleasure to meet you. Talk to you again. Likewise. Okay people, this is Martin Patella for Life Enthusiast at 866-543-3388. Call me and ask me questions. Life Enthusiast, restoring vitality to you and to the planet. Signing off.